Hello, I'm uh, Suman Kakarparthi, Principal Product Manager for IVAM. I want to talk about transport independent design, high site availability, and network capacity optimization. Transport independent design. For you guys to actually build a network or build a network architecture and have real true agility, you want to make yourself uh, completely agnostic to the underlying transport, right? So if you have uh, traditional transports, whether it is MPLS, internet, 3G, 4G, or dual MPLS and so on, the first thing that you want to do is create a transport independent design so that you can overlay, you can uh, enable your network policy or business policy on top of it, right? So the first step that we do in terms of enabling you or delivering a transport independent design is we will hide the underlay away. What we do is we'll put uh, the underlay in a separate uh, uh, virtual routing instance, what we call as WERFs, and then we'll put overlay on top of it. And for the overlay, we choose uh, DMVPN, right? So we put an overlay on all, on all the links. Trust me, I'm going to mess this picture up even more as we go. <laughs> so, and a big reason is why we choose DMVPN. If you look at in Cisco, we have multiple uh, overlays. We have GET, uh, Flex, uh, and multiple overlays. We particularly choose DMVPN for, uh, uh, for, for IVAN deployment, right? There are three reasons why we, why did we did that. One, security, scale, and flexibility. And the first aspect is really about security. Yes, the tunnels are actually encrypted. It's AES-256 encryption on the tunnels, right? And the most importantly, DMVPN actually supports Ike v2. So it's not proprietary. You can actually do a pairway security uh, and an open standard key exchange using Ike v2. So we choose Ike v2 uh, for, uh, for the key exchange. And two is scale. This is actually critical for us. Uh, so DMVPN is actually uh, very matured. It's actually uh, been and it has proven deployments. Uh, we have around tens of thousands of uh, sites actually enabled with the dynamic multipoint VPN uh, deployments, right? And one of the key aspects here is uh, when I, the, the real word is proven. I'm not claiming that it can scale. We have scaled deployments already that are actually that can scale to tens of thousands of sites. So definitely scale is a real driving factor for us. And the third aspect is flexibility. When I talk about flexibility, it's really about basic fundamentals on how uh, dynamic multipoint VPN operates. So when a new spoke comes up, the first step it does is, hey, I will register, I'll register with the data center, right? I'll register with the hub. Hey, I'm here and I'll register with the hub so that it gets the basic configuration. The second step is if a spoke wants to communicate with the other spoke, which is in this case I said branch, let's say branch A wants to communicate to branch B. So it will come to the come to the hub and say like comes knocking and say like, hey, how do I communicate to branch B? And then the hub enables a shortcut from branch A to branch B. And once the communication is done, this uh, shortcut is uh, taken out. Right. So it gives me a full mesh topology uh, flexibility to actually enable on your, uh, on your MPLS or your internet network. And I can do this in a scaled fashion. So when you said scalability, when you said tens of thousands, you're referring to tens of thousands with IWAN in general or tens of thousands with just DMVPN? Yeah. With the DMVPN. With, with, with just the overlay aspect of it, I'm saying we already have uh, approved deployments with uh, DMVPN itself in tens of thousands of scale. Do you have a scalability limit with DMVPN as far as how many, sp or, I'm sorry, IWAN with how many spokes you can have at one point? So we actually tested up to, uh, up to actually more than 2,000, uh, uh, up to 2,000 in our own lab. That's not because we hit an issue, it's because that's the number of routers and uh, devices that we got, right? Uh, but we have, uh, currently we have deployments itself actually reaching a little bit more than that, right? The actual deployments are actually more, uh, better scale than, uh, than 2,000. Where's that constraint at? Where's that, so 2,000, why is that the limit? Where's the issue with that? Where's the constraint? So when it comes to the scale, uh, initially it is, okay, the, the, how much the controller can take. Now, the master controller is actually virtualized. You can run it as CSR. 
we even got even more horsepower on the on the master controller. So initially, when we started in uh, Ivan 1.0, when we started, the constraint that we hit was on the on say like okay, I can uh, the master controller on uh, uh, on an ASR box. This is this is what it can handle, right? Now, once we actually virtualized it, we virtualized master controller, and we said it can run as cloud service router, uh, and we actually put it on a bare metal server. That is where we are able to actually scale, scale way higher. So to, to your answer, we actually have scale deployments uh, over 2,000 and above. That is what we tested. Uh, with actually where the limit is, uh, we don't have the data in terms of exactly where it actually breaks, uh, you know, but all the way, all the way, like uh, where it can go. But uh, with, uh, if you have anything in uh, two, three thousand, you can easy, easily deploy. For bigger scale deployments, even let's say six thousand is a deployment that we are actually in the process right now. While we are deploying, is we are actually dividing them into uh, into virtual domains, and the, there, once you divide it into virtual domains, you can actually scale way higher, right? So, is this another controller on in, in addition to the APIC controller, or is this all tied into the APIC as well? So, or can it be tied into the sure, APIC? Sure. Okay. So the actual, when we talk about uh, DMVP and hub, DMVP and hub can be on the same router, same uh, device as your ASR1K. Okay. Right? It, it can be part of your existing router, right? So when I talk about, when I mentioned about, hey, I scaled to 10,000, I'm really talking about with ASR1K itself on the head end, you are able to do that, right? So the scale numbers actually come from there. Okay. And the most important part is, when it comes to DMVPN, it's there in the market for quite some time. With IWAN, with SDVANA, with, with our approach, we have a prescriptive solution on like how you enable, uh, how we enable IWAN, right? Based upon Cisco validated design and best practices, well, the first thing is the CVDs are published. And the second aspect is, with the controller, going back to the controller, all this is actually automated. And uh, Pedro will do an end-to-end -end demo at the end. What you will see is you won't enter a single CLI command to uh, DMVPN specific command to actually enable the overlay. So this part is completely automated using the Epic EM controller. Okay. So let me talk about high site availability. Now this is a very important outcome to, to our customers. At the end of the day, what they really care about is site availability. How can you deliver better uptime, whether it is finance or whatever they're looking for, how can we actually improve the uptime, right? So with transport independent design, with uh, intelligent path control, we actually enable rapid detection in terms of uh, getting the health of the network and then reacting to that. And this is, again, goes back to our fundamental principle, right? For the performance and scale, the policy distribution is centralized, right? If you want to leverage all your links for a particular application so, the, so that you get maximum availability, that policy is actually centralized. You'll actually put it in one place, right? On the branch routers, on the branch routers, all you see is one line saying, hey, get my policy from here. But the policy enforcement like reacting to, uh, reacting to a outage or monitoring it and reacting to the outage, that part is actually distributed. So that's the reason I can detect these uh, outages and then react to that in, uh, in sub-second, right? So this is exactly what we do with the site availability. We actually have that policy actually centralized and then we react to that uh, in, uh, in actually individual branches. That's one. The second aspect is how smartly can we do this? When I mean, the, when I mean smartly, it, it's really about efficiency, right? So you can do it by actually sending, uh, by the traditional ways are there, you can keep, keep on sending IPSLA probes or some, some other probes to actually find out whether a link is active or not. But with IWAM, this, this is completely different. We actually use what we call it as smart sensing. Now smart sensing, you, if there is traffic on the network, you don't send any probes. You use the existing traffic on the network. If there is no traffic on the network, it will actually start using probes to actually detect the connectivity and so on. So that's what we call it as smart sensing. And the third aspect is really about 
how do you lever how do you be even a little bit more smarter when you have metered interfaces in this case i put 3g 4g circuit and with 3g 4g it has the the specialty of 3g 4g is uh, it's metered and it's going to cost you if you just put everything on it right so what we did there is uh, when you actually do availability we we let user actually define when an outage occurs, what is it that you want to actually have high availability? And you can see that in the demo too. Saying like, hey, I want to protect uh, just uh, business critical traffic on all the links, right? So that means if MPLS goes down, I'll move to internet. Internet goes down, I'll move to 3G, 4G, and I'll protect them, right? And let's say you have gaming. On the gaming, if you will go through internet because you have more bandwidth and you will send it to internet. Now, if internet goes down, you, you don't want it on 3G, 4G. It's okay to black hole or to drop gaming if there is a network outage issue. So that's exactly what we need, what we mean by saying, okay, it's when you deliver site availability, you understand the underlying transport and you actually can actually mention your policy at a macro level saying, this is what I need in terms of availability. Protect the applications that matter and for the rest of them, take a default policy. The second key aspect is network capacity optimization. And there is a very specific reason why I said it's capacity optimization, not load balancing. So load balancing is all about uh, distributing packets on these links and then be done with it, right? You just can have a simple hash, distribute the packets and be done with it. But capacity optimization is much more smarter than that. Capacity optimization is about understanding the characteristics of underlying transport. In this case, MPLS, Internet, 3G, 4G, each of them have a distinct characteristics from a business perspective and also from an SLA perspective. Right? And the second aspect is understanding the applications that you are optimizing it for. We'll talk about the visibility in a minute, but it's more about understanding the applications and then tying it with, uh, with the links. So when we enable capacity optimization, and I will show you in a minute, when we enable capacity optimization, if an application is actually going fine and it doesn't, it, it met its SLS, it is meeting its SLS, let's say I have uh, WebEx traffic and it met its SLS, we don't want to actually move it for the sake of uh, load balancing. Our goal of load balancing or capacity optimization is not about actually making sure the pipes are equal, right? That's really not the goal. So our policy is actually, you can, what we do is we take the default traffic, which doesn't have any application performance policy, and use that traffic to actually load balance across, spread it across the link so that we get maximum out of the links, right? So if you have a business critical traffic and it's going fine, there's no point in actually taking it out and then uh, doing uh, load balancing just for the heck of it. So that's why I call it as capacity optimization because it, it does a little bit differently than just uh, distributing the packets. So that's one from a technology aspect, right? From a business aspect, you have all these three links and you can clearly see, let's say I have another satellite, doesn't matter how many links you have. Let's say I say 3G, 4G is metered. The last thing that you want to do is for the sake of load balancing, put the YouTube traffic on 3G, 4G. So you can, at a macro policy level, you can actually say, enable capacity optimization for only certain traffics and for, uh, for uh, YouTube or for browsing traffic, exclude 3G, 4G from the, from the capacity optimization algorithm. So you can do it in a centralized way. And then if your business dictates, if you have a unlimited plan, it doesn't matter. But if, if you don't, then you can actually exclude a certain, uh, uh, certain van transport from your capacity optimization. Right. So Pedro, can you show like, uh, how many steps do you need to actually enable capacity optimization? So one example here, we have our uh, database group here um, where I can go and define that I want to do my uh, capacity. So let's say that I don't um, here actually. Let me show you the, um, the, um, the, uh, this one. Instead of selecting uh, my MPS as my uh, path preferred and Comcast, I can just go and enable it without having uh, the ability to, to choose. So in that case, 
uh, will have no application performance for my database, which means that we'll be using the capacity to the most possible way in a network. In the case that you want a controller to actually define what is the best path for your uh, running your applications in the network. So, so as, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sure. So the basic, the basic takeaway is we do load balancing by default if you don't have an application policy. If there is an application policy, we actually uh, obey the application policy and don't disturb the traffic for the sake of load balancing. We start with uh, the traffic that is just going on there. We, we use the default class and use it for capacity optimization. Okay. And the only thing that, that is actually even more interesting is when you have a new flows that actually come up, whether there is a new WebEx flow or something come up, we actually take the best of best in the sense like uh, the, the, if all the links are actually within the SLAs, that rarely happens, but let's say if all the links are in SLA, uh, obeying the SLAs, we actually take the best of best in terms of with the least amount of uh, capacity on that link, that is what we select. And if none of the links are within the SLA, we take the best of worst, where given that everybody is not, none of them actually obeying, are obeying the SLAs, we take the best of worst there. How is the system determining when a a link is not performing correctly? You mentioned Jitter earlier as one thing. Sure. Um, it, it, are you creating synthetic traffic across the link and monitoring loss, or are you more intelligently tracking each application flow, or what? How, how do you know if if I've got twenty percent packet loss on a link? How are you detecting that? Yeah. So definitely we'll cover it in the next section, but I will answer it right now. Uh, so we use uh, what we call as uh, performance monitoring. So that is uh, NetFlow on steroids. It's actually there on your routers. So if there is existing traffic, we actually enable the monitoring and get that information, right? So once you get that information passively on the far end, right? It sends, uh, if, as I said, the policy distribution is actually distributed. Let me actually draw you, draw it, it becomes more easy. So in your case, let's say there is uh, a WebEx uh, flow coming from here to here. She worked very hard on this thing, so I need to use them. Like <laughs> <laughs> so the, the WebEx flow actually comes in, right? And here, I will actually start monitoring using passive monitoring, right? So I have the stats over here, right? Yeah, so I have uh, the stats of our stats for WebEx. Now, the most important part is since the policy is actually distributed, I know exactly what are the SLAs for WebEx. And the WebEx, let's say, for the sake of it, let's say 20 milliseconds. And let's say this uh, flow, uh, WebEx actually violated this 20 milliseconds. Now, the branch actually monitors this and then sends an alert to the data center. It could be data center or it could be another branch if you have spoke to spoke communication. Doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Sends an alert saying, hey, WebEx did not obey my SLA, right? So the data center or the, or the sender will actually move it to the other uh, WAN links. Now, how do I know which WAN link to move? Because I'm actually monitoring all the WAN links and I have a global level view on how the SLA is doing on each of these WAN links. So the goal is to make sure 20 milliseconds that WebEx requires, you have a global data that says, how do, I mean, what is the jitter on each of these WAN links? Then WAN link B says, I have, uh, I have 80 milliseconds, and WAN link C says, I have uh, 10 milliseconds. Then I got it. I will actually move it to WAN link C because it is actually delivering my SLAs on that. Right. Okay. So this is, again, this, uh, this is really about dynamically enabling this behavior dynamically, right? You really don't need user intervention, any of that. And most importantly, and uh, we actually expose all this information using NetFlow v9 or IPFix. 